This presentation is going to be the start of acute glomerular nephritis, chronic glomerular nephritis, and nephrotic syndrome. Acute glomerular nephritis is immunologic in nature and it affects both kidney functioning. It will excrete proteins and blood cells out of the kidneys. So typically your patient presents with cola colored urine, hematuria, edema, they're hypertensive, and they're, they either have azotemia or uremia. Azotemia is actually high nitrogen in the blood. Uremia is a raised level in the blood of urea and other nitrogenous waste compounds that are normally eliminated by the kidneys. Both of these conditions occur when the GFR is significantly low, BUN and creatinine are critically high. Because these wastes are now building up in the bloodstream because its transfer is to the vascular system. Severe manifestations and clinical findings include flank pain, also known as CVA pain, which is your costovertebral angle pain. They may have fever and they be, may be lethargic in presentation. Diagnostically, we want to look at a couple of our lab values. H and H can be decreased in reaction to an anemic response with the loss of blood or irritation from the infection. BUN and creatinine will be elevated and the GFR is decreased. Creatinine and GFR have an inverse relationship, so as one decreases, the other increases. In a urinalysis, it will show red blood cells, proteinuria, hematuria, and that would all be present. In digging deeper into the cause of AGN, ultrasound or CT will show exactly where the inflammation is in the renal system. The ultrasound will show any inflammation in regards to the size of the kidney. Pharmacologically, corticosteroids are oftentimes ordered to help decrease with inflammation. And with the hypertension, we want to give specific medications. We want to give calcium channel blockers that will actually increase renal blood flow and ACE inhibitors. The interesting thing with ACE inhibitors is that in very low doses at five milligrams or less, ACE inhibitors are kidney and renal safe. It lowers the resistance in the blood vessels of the kidneys. If there is an infection, penicillin class of antibiotics is the drug of choice because it is not nephrotoxic. However, Penicillin has a high incidence of allergies, so please make sure you're checking this when caring for these patients. Now we're going to look at the diet. So what can we do? We want to increase the carbs. We want to increase their calories. We want to start them on a low protein but good protein diet decrease their sodium intake so that they're not holding on to fluid. We want to monitor daily weights, keeping an eye on strict I's and O's in order to monitor their actual fluid status. Complications from acute glomerular nephritis may include hypertensive encephalopathy. The symptoms of hypertensive encephalopathy include headache, restlessness, nausea, disturbances of consciousness, seizures, retinal hemorrhaging, and papilloedema. We want to decrease the blood pressure because it will continue to increase the symptoms. So in this case, we must aggressively treat the hypertension to change it. Patients can also go into heart failure, and you cannot reverse this fluid overload. If pulmonary edema 
occurs, it is from fluid buildup. And in order to decrease that fluid, our go-to adjusting medication is going to be furosemide or Lasix. If a patient suffers with prolonged acute glomerular nephritis, it can ultimately lead to end-stage renal disease. Treatment in order to decrease the likelihood of it turning into end-stage renal disease includes steroids, corticosteroids specifically to decrease the inflammation, plasmapheresis, which is actually the removal, treatment, and return of components of blood plasma from the blood circulation. Cytotoxic agents are also administered to help reverse the nephritis. It is successful but can be fatal to patients. And ultimately, your last form of treatment can be hemodialysis to help maintain adequate perfusion and release of the toxins building up within the body. In discharge planning and thinking about supporting the family and the patient and the home care needs, we want to make sure that we do a very good job of medication reconciliation, that they understand what medications they're going home on and what changes that have been made. If someone is on corticosteroids, we need to make sure that they understand it would be tapered unless it's a long-term treatment for these patients. Dietary recommendations, we want to make sure we're restricting fluids, decreasing their protein intake, their sodium, their potassium, and their phosphorus. We also want to make sure that they have follow-up appointments scheduled with the nephrologist. And they also want to follow up to make sure that their meds and that they're being compliant with all of their discharge paperwork. Moving on to chronic glomerular nephritis. Chronic glomerular nephritis is most often occurring with patients who have untreated acute glomerular nephritis or consistent repeated episodes of acute glomerular nephritis. A significant amount of increased lipids, patients who suffer with lupus, and any patients who suffer with diabetic glomerulosclerosis, which actually is indicative with kidneys becoming reduced in size, tubules becoming scarred, and the arteries of those tubules becoming thickened. Blood pressure may be increased or decreased and may be a clinical manifestation of chronic glomerular nephritis. Your blood pressure will increase with kidney damage and waste buildup. But depending on dehydration status, the blood pressure could then become decreased. Retinal findings will include visual changes due to growth or deposits commonly associated with CGN due to the change in the vasculature within the body. Retinal separation or vasculitis can cause vision loss. We're also gonna see weight loss, irritability. Patients may complain of headache and or dizziness. They'll have periorbital peripheral edema, which are typical findings of anyone holding on to additional fluid. And think about your patients that have CHF and what those signs and symptoms include. Adventitious breath sounds, uh, fluid retention. With chronic glomerular nephritis, we want to look at the labs. We want to focus on specific gravity, noting that specific gravity will go up when the urine is more concentrated, it has to do with timing. There's going to be a lot of protein urea, and the GFR is going to be less than 50. The patients are then going to be seen hyperkalemic. So what are we concerned about with hyperkalemic patients? 
we're looking at the cardiac impact of that. They're going to show metabolic acidosis. They're going to be anemic. Their albumin levels are going to be low. Their calcium levels are going to be low. And their phosphorus is going to be increased. Diagnostically, we can do chest x-rays to actually focus on and look at the size of the kidneys. Uh, EKGs in order to focus on the change in the potassium levels. CAT scan and MRIs to go back and actually get a better picture of what the kidneys look like. For nursing interventions, we want to make sure that we give antihypertensive medications, including Lasix. Dietary guidelines, we want to make sure that we're decreasing the patient's intake of fluids and their sodium intake. But with chronic glomerular nephritis, we want to make sure we're increasing the protein because at this point, their albumin levels are very low. We want to make sure, though, in increasing their protein, we are using high biologic valued proteins, which are less processed. So I like to think of these proteins as close to the animal proteins, such as eggs, lean chicken, nuts, etc. If the patient is getting UTIs, make sure that we're treating them and preventing them. Preventative measures, including a review of hygienic practices, specifically in our female population. You're urinating before and after intercourse. And then the ultimate uh, treatment that may have to be utilized for these patients could be temporary and or permanent hemodialysis. Moving on to nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is actually a complication of glomerular nephritis. It's a group of symptoms that include protein in the urine, which will show as foamy urine, low pr blood protein levels, high cholesterol levels, high triglycerol levels, and swelling or edema. The patient will also be seen losing fluid from the vascular system and may actually start to sound fluid overloaded when doing a head-to-toe assessment. So in a patient that's fluid overloaded, we're expecting them to have adventitious breath sounds, and this is one of your assessment findings for these patients. They're going to be tachycardic, hypotensive, they're going to be very pale, anorexic. They're going to be lethargic. Increasing complications include infection, thromboembolism in their renal veins, pulmonary embolisms, acute renal failure, atherosclerosis, and increased clotting factors. If we see a patient who becomes hypotensive, how do we increase one's blood pressure? Is there a medication we could give them? It's a blood component. It is albumin. That is the most common, effective way of increasing hypotension with nephrotic syndrome is administering albumin. Patients at highest risk for nephrotic syndrome include patients who are suffering with SLE or lupus, diabetic nephropathy, HIV patients, patients who are suffering with heart failure, pericarditis, hepatitis B or C, and malaria. What's a common underlying factor with all of these patients? They are immunocompromised. In di getting diagnostics in order to figure out what's going on specifically with these patients, we want to get a full history, finding out if they've had glomerular nephritis in the past, what are their symptoms. We also need to do some lab and diagnostic testing as well. The urinalysis is going to show urine casts, 
protein is probably going to be present and it's going to be foamy in appearance from that protein. Their albumin levels are going to be low, their sodium levels are going to be low, their potassium levels are going to be low. They're going to have hyperlipidemia. Hypercoagulability typically are also present with these patients. The BUN is going to be elevated because there's damage to the filters within our kidneys. And the additional diagnostic testing that can be done is a renal ultrasound or a renal biopsy. The renal ultrasound will specifically focus and show any inflammation found within the kidney. A renal biopsy will show exactly what's causing the increased excretion of protein in the urine. If we're thinking about patients who undergo a renal biopsy, we need to be very cautious about post-operative care of these patients. There may be slight bruising over the biopsy site, but we want to monitor to make sure it does not become significant, that the pain does not intensify, and if the patient starts showing more symptoms of blood loss, such as their blood pressure is dropping significantly more, they're extremely tachycardic, this could be indicative of internal bleeding, and we would need increased care for this patient at this time. Last but not least, when focusing on nephrotic syndrome, we want to think about the pharmacologic interventions that we can provide with these patients. So because our albumin is low, we can administer albumin to increase those levels within the body. It's going to pull the fluid into the body's circulating volume. Then, inadvertently, we're going to have to administer diuretics to reduce the edema seen in these patients. ACE inhibitors in their small kidney safe doses of five milligrams or less are utilized to decrease the proteinuria seen in these patients' urinalysis. We're also going to give lipid lowering agents to decrease the likelihood of this occurring again. We want to make sure that we manage dehydration and manage the fluid shifts experienced by these patients. We want to prevent further infection and or problems that could lead to more chronic and severe problems within the kidneys 